And I should be joined on the line now by Colin Stetson, who will be performing on Monday at the Ottawa Jazz Festival. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good, Brian. Thanks for having me. Good. Thanks for being on. I'm excited to, uh, to chat with you. So you're in town to play two shows at the Ottawa Jazz Festival. Tell us about the two shows and how they're going to be different. Um, the two shows. One, one uh, as you guys have heard earlier uh, in your program, there's a duo with my wife, Sarah Neufeld, and uh, playing music off of our record uh, that we released last year. And then the second show on that same day is going to be uh, the uh, my newest uh, record release, which is called Sorrow, or Reimagining of Goretzky's Third Symphony. And we're going to be playing that. I think the showtime is at 8 or 9 on Monday. And so, yeah, that, that's a completely different ensemble. It's a 12-piece ensemble with vocals and guitars and drums and horns, and, and that will be uh, presenting the entirety of Koretsky's Third Symphony uh, as uh, imagined by, uh, by me and, and the ensemble. Excellent. Well, I'm going to talk a little more about uh, Soro soon, but first, you recorded Never Were the Way She Was with your longtime collaborator and, and now wife, Sarah Neufeld. Now, you've performed together for years, perhaps most visibly with uh, Arcade Fire. How much of, of that album was written while on the road together, and how much was written while at home? The vast majority of that one was all written at home, and and you know over a pretty brief span of time compared to a lot of compared to my solo records. Usually, like a solo record of mine, the writing will will get done on the road and at home, and over the span of you know a year or two. And uh, that one, we were really uh, we we had to be pretty uh, economical and efficient about the way that we spend our time when we're together. <laughs> Because there's not uh, there's not an enormous amount of it. What was because what, of schedules? Yeah. What was easy and what was hard about doing this album together? Uh, what was hard is really just the the just the you know the basic mechanics of saxophone v violin. Uh, you know, dealing with the volume discrepancy of course, and you know, some sonic timbral stuff, just finding a place where they can mesh and where they can be supportive and um, and not uh, in any way detrimental to one another and um, not, you know, uh, mostly how do I uh, uh, remain present but not in the way. <clears throat> and so, but that was just, I think that that's not an ongoing problem, it's more of a of, of an issue that has, you know, just kind of had to conceptually be overcome initially, and then once we did, everything was fine. But in terms, I mean, mostly, I mean, it's boring, but mostly it's when we work together, it's pretty, the, the ease is, is pretty much throughout. Um, we have a, you know, like you said, we've, we've, been, we've been together for over 10 years, and we've been playing music together for, for that long as well in all different uh, scenarios. And uh, so <clears throat> when, we, uh, when we played just the two of us, it really is a, a great way. To, it's, it's, just, you know, it's just streamlined, and, and, uh, and um, we've, you know, we've always had a good working relationship. So I can't, yeah, there's not really much to say on that besides we really enjoy it, and we have a, it's just a, a really um, kind of beautifully distilled uh, version of both of our solo entities and voices kind of come together and, and they're to, you know, then uh, free to be whatever it is that they, that we want them to be. Um, mm. and, and the first time either of us had, had taken that direction where we really brought in unadulterated our, uh, our solo persona into a, another project with someone else. Because usually, you know, you're, it's just, you don't ever bring that whole thing intact into a collaboration, but yeah, that was the first time, and uh, we're and we're uh, very happy with how uh, how it went. Well, and and the the two sounds mesh together beautifully. It really comes off well, particularly on the album that you you did together. You did mention though one of Thank the you. challenges was the I guess the saxophone not overwhelming, um, you know, you know her violin and. You said you did overcome that. How how did you overcome that? How do you address something like that when you're when you're developing music and when you're rehearsing? 
control. Uh, there's really no way around it besides making sure that you can still. I mean, it's, it's a lot of t- kind of technical mumbo jumbo for me with with reg- regard to how how I play the saxophones, how you split multiphonics, how you you know splitting tones, getting uh, like, a, like a really big breadth, a wide breadth of of sound and 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 timbre uh, and pitch, um, and a lot of that, a lot of how I get that or I how I have gotten that historically is through volume. Um, by pushing more air through and expanding that the sound, and I just had to learn how to do the same things <clears throat> at a lower volume um, with with less air, and so you know it's just a one of those things where initially you have a you know there's a theory and you <laughs> you you figure there must be a way to if if it's physically possible to get there, then you just have to you know you have to give some time to in order to learn to you know to to get it under your grasp um and uh and and try to become it yeah. and uh and and it was physically possible and now it it is <laughs> so yeah like as in all the things that I've ever done with the uh, with the horn it all kind of starts out as as a dream concept and uh, and then you have to try to implement it and if if it turns out that it, it is physically possible you will get there eventually you know it, it sounds almost uh, as mentally taxing as, as it would be physically to to do that so oh, sometimes it's frustrating when you have a concept and you're and you know that your day one is always really frustrating um because you can imagine day 30 but you have to get through the first 29. Right. And and some of them really, really suck. That's how all the kids are feeling right now at the end of the school year. It's like, we've, we've made it through to day 30, <laughs> right? So, so you, you most recently released uh, an interpretation of Gadeshki's Symphony Number no. 3. What drew you to that piece? Well, I've been listening to that piece uh, just obsessively for decades i think i i first heard it in in university um when i was about 17 18 and it's just it's just been one of those staples one of the few you know recordings and pieces of music that is is just part of your part of my you know diet like my music consumption certain things that you just have to have um around on a regular basis for your for your internal health and uh that that was one of them and it was mid 90s when uh I was living in San Francisco and my sister and I my sister who is the vocalist on the record we were listening to this and I was you know just you know kind of daydreaming about wouldn't it be cool if and that that was when we first started um uh, you know conceptualizing about how how this might how this might you know come come to life in a different way um you know be, between the two of us heading this thing off and uh you know it got kind of shelved over the years uh for you know for a good fifteen really, and it just the circumstances just all lined up perfectly in the past few to created you know a, a perfect doorway to get this thing under the in the hands of the right ensemble and um and out and re- recorded in the proper in the proper manner and then and, and put out so um it's, a, it's been a long time coming but i'm really excited that we finally made it happen absolutely it's, it's interesting you you refer to it kind of as a, a piece you've gone back to throughout your life and i, I felt the exact same way uh, when my my mother introduced it to me with the the Don Upshaw version with her singing the uh, soprano yeah. piece and and it's it's you know just stuck with me and over the years I've had to play it at least once or twice a year on the show I mean it's a longer longer piece right but it's just I have that same strong connection so when I saw that you were doing it I was super excited and said I have to get him on the show <laughs> so excellent I, I'm oh, go ahead. I'm curious as to how easy it was to perform with saxophone being a, a primary instrument. We're, Performing that piece? Well, yeah, perform. Yeah, performing the the symphony number no. three because obviously the original version does not uh, does not sound the same as as yours. So, how easy was it for you to sort of reinterpret it with that as a primary instrument? 
Well, I mean, it's very easy to reinterpret it. Uh, it was easy for me in, in my in my head. I mean, I, it's been growing and and it's you know sounded somewhat like this for in, in in my mind for the past two decades. But yeah, when you when you actually do get the people together and start to make uh, noise together, you, yeah, uh, volume has to be wrangled and 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 the 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 relationships between the different instruments have to be wrangled. I mean, the fact that there's drums in the core of this of this uh, interpretation was something that definitely needs you know needed and needs to be managed. So it, it's certainly challenging. Mm-hmm. You know, making sure that all voices are heard and heard equally because the the composition, the counterpoint um, of this whole piece is very, you know, kind of revolves around that necessity, you know, that, that everything be, be uh, equally heard and felt. And so, you know, playing with, with sonorities and playing with hierarchies of sound was definitely one of the approaches that I took with this. And, <clears throat> but... But yeah, everyone has to be. I mean, the the players that I pull, pulled together are some of my closest friends uh, throughout my whole life, and and some of the greatest players that I know. Uh, so everyone's just bringing their A game, and really, uh, it, you have to be really uh, attentive, big big ears, and um, and uh, and and playing you know, together. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned your sister, Megan Stetson, sings on the recording. Now, I, I understand Gadeshki's version is, is written for a soprano, and I believe your sister is a, a mezzo-soprano. So if that's the case, sure. what kind of adjustments did you have to make, if any? We didn't adjust the piece, actually. We've been talking about this for years, and you know, she spent a number of years you know, rehearsing, learning this piece, learning the, the language, um, getting the diction right, uh, and and also you know of course learning the the you know internalizing the music and the characterization. But one of the things about Megan that is unique among mezzos, she has quite a significant range. It's a little bit um, a little bit higher and a little bit lower than most mezzos. So where this piece written for a soprano, much of it actually sits right along the bottom of their range. Um, you know, sung by Megan, you know, the majority of it is actually right in her sweet spot. So um, it does, and we we did find that it ends up uh, working quite well you know, when, when she's enmeshed with the rest of the the fact that the ensemble that we used is so you know, the timbrely, so much more um, not you know not richer than than a uh, an orchestra, but is certainly much more dense mm-hmm. sonically and timbrely. And I think that her voice holds up in that context uh, better than a soprano would have uh, you know, in this particular um, in this particular case. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, yeah. do you have any sense of how your recording is being received by diehard classical music fans? Uh, I don't. I, I have some. I mean, when we premiered it, it did premiere on uh, was it Classic FM, which is a big classical website in the UK, and so it did get quite a bit of traffic in the classical world initially. And uh, I don't honestly, I don't really read reviews, and I don't pay much attention to chatter. But um, but everything that I did hear, everything that kind of got its way back to me, was positive. I mean, I haven't really haven't heard of any uh, anybody whose feathers are extremely ruffled. <laughs> that was never that, that was never our intention. That was definitely the furthest thing from my mind is that anyone would ever be upset by this. Right. Um, that that we'd that in playing this music we'd ever be be accused of you know in some way doing it a disservice or or being you know try, attempting to be malicious with it um cuz cuz our my and all, and all of our intentions were really just to celebrate it in the best way we knew how and uh, that may and I guess the best way that I know how seems unconventional to some but um never has seemed unconventional to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, perspective is key. Yeah. 
Now, I've only ever seen you perform solo, and I'm curious, is when you're doing a solo performance, do you ever use you know, looping pedals or technology, or do you strictly rely on other things like circular breathing to add more layers to the, the solo performance? Yeah, I never use looping or effects. Um, that was just... I made a, you know, one basic parameter, and that was that all the music... Um, involved in that in the solo um, material would have to be generated by me physically in the moment, and there would be no overdubs, and there would be no electronics, no no, no assistance um, on stage in terms of the generation of the sound. And um, and that's you know that's just kind of that's one of the the, the core principles of that particular music. Now you use the word had to be done physically by you. And, and the physically thing is, is important to me because when I've seen you perform, it, it's almost exhausting to watch. So I'm curious, how physically taxing is it for you? And, and how do you prepare yourself to do this night after night? Um, it is extremely physically taxing. <laughs> um, some shows more than others. It really depends on what I'm playing. Um, you know, uh, you know, partic- you know the, the specifics of the set, uh, how long it is, and what what songs are involved. And but how do I prepare? I mean, I just have to do this all the time. I can't. If I took if I took a break, I don't mean take a break from the instrument, like not play for a week. I'm, I don't know that I've ever not played for a week. Uh, but I mean, if I don't, if I took five days and didn't play this material, if I didn't circular breathe. Um, for X amount of time every day, and um, and and push those the, those muscles and push my lungs and uh, to to maintain that, then I would have an equal amount of time, if not more, of building back up to the place that I was before I stopped. If that was clear, so there's um, there's an enormous, uh, very very quick amount of atrophy that happens in face muscles and in um, the uh, and 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 in forearm and hand muscles um, and tendons and stuff, there's a rigidity that that can happen very quickly um, if I don't keep this stuff up all the time. And so yeah, it just involves. It's like um, it's like athletics in, to, in in that respect, where you just have to keep everything primed and ready to uh, operate on that on on, a, on that high level, um, especially around uh, tour time. Because then it gets really, you know, the added aspect of traveling every day and never getting a good night's sleep and sometimes being really jet lagged and having the shows be actual shows. So you're you're not just playing in your in your own space with yourself. You're you're you know you're out there presenting it, and so there's quite a bit more adrenaline and and the and the performance of them is quite a, a bit more uh, over the top. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that c- it can be really exhausting, but it's it's how I've that's how I've created. I keep on, I don't know why, but <laughs> I keep on making every uh, striving to go to further places with 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 each record and with each new song I'm writing. So that, it, uh, it, it sounds whereas, very much like an elite athlete, really. I mean, the 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 training and the upkeep involved. So yeah, I mean, it's just it's just. Uh, why not? I mean, I have it to use. So, um, and it's always been something that's fascinated me: the the, the pursuit of it, the challenge of it, and the um, and then when you, it's kind of creating these um, ecstatic uh, states when you when you push yourself into that into those um, very extreme physical um, bouts. So, I mean, I was just about to say the something like judges which when i recorded it was probably a piece that um i i, I could I, I had just gotten past the just barely could play it point and it was about a five or six minute piece and i had just gotten it under my um hands and and under the physicality so that i felt confident that it could be done and now uh, judges is something that you know can span 10 to 12 minutes and go many di- more different um, and uh, deeper f- uh, sonic spaces just because of how much more um, 
capable, I guess I am, mm-hmm. uh, in in those in that those physical respects now than I was. When was that? Seven years ago, I guess, when they recorded that. So, or, or eight or six years ago. So, um, yeah, there's 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 always a I, I feel kind of a, a drive to always put myself <clears throat> into those. Uh, spaces where I'm pushing my my limits because on some you know em- emotional uh, physical emotional level I'm much more satisfied um, with that than um, just coasting I guess right and, and the music is is better for it right so I I would hope so I I think so because <laughs> if it's not then I'm really busting ass for no reason <laughs> what's the point right now you mentioned yeah. you, you didn't think you'd gone a week without playing your instrument and that and that kind of stuck with me so I, I'm assuming you know you're like anyone else you you may want to take a vacation now and then so let's say you wanted to go and you know go go to Paris for a week do you then bring your instrument with you even though you're on vacation sightseeing yeah I mean I rarely. I don't know. I don't remember the last time we got away for a week. Um, well, I mean, we, yeah, we went to Hawaii a couple of years ago, and and we were gone for ten days, and we brought our instruments and played most days. So, there, yeah. I mean, the instruments are usually there. On 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 rare occasions, will there'll be an excursion where that won't be the case, but probably won't span for much more than a few days. That's dedication. So I know that uh, you've been a fan of Tom Waits for a long time. What was it like getting to work with him? Oh, working with Tom was, uh, you know, was, was literally a dream come true. I had been a fan of his since high school, and you know, fan is not even the right word. It's just he's absolutely integral to my musical persona, to to my upbringing, everything. Uh, he just he changed he changed the whole field for me when I first heard his music. It just opened everything up. And so, I mean, yeah, I I had I had planned you know, huge you know aspects of my life around the, the just the idea of maybe meeting him sometime. So I, mean, I moved to San Francisco with the with the um, express intent to. Uh, heighten my chances <laughs> of coming in contact with him and being able to work with him at some point. So it was, you know, truly fortuitous when I guess I'd only been there for about a year and a half or two before my whole, my, my, my plan to, you know, to worm into his, <laughs> into his uh, sphere through just sheer activity in the Bay area, just it, it, it ended up working. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, yeah, you, so you have, and, and then, yeah, go ahead. No, sorry. So you have, you have two shows on, on Monday at the Ottawa Jazz Festival. And as, as we mentioned, the first is with Sarah Neufeld. Will you strictly be doing music from your album together for that show? Yeah, okay. the, the, both, of, uh, both of the records will be, will be represented. I don't think we're going to be playing anything new with the, with the duo. Um, we will probably play a couple songs, um, a couple solo song we always tend to throw in a, a solo song or two of, of for each of us and so i know that she'll probably play something from her latest release that came out earlier this year the the ridge and that um i will most likely be playing something that i'm you know some a new piece from a record that i'm working on right now excellent and other than that yeah that will be entirely the duo and sorrow of course is the uh, all three movements of that symphony Excellent. So, so no stairway to heaven covers that night then. No, no time for <laughs> no time for covers. All right. So, uh, again, you're playing uh, that show Monday night with Sarah Newfeld, and later that evening, you're doing your performance of Sorrow. And as you mentioned, you're going to have the full cast with you uh, on stage. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. That is the, that is the truth. All right. I'm not sure Marathon. if there's any tickets left for for that one. People have to go and check on the website. But uh, I really appreciate you uh, joining me today. It was a really great chat, and uh, I look I'm looking forward to uh, catching the show on Monday. Excellent, man. Looking forward to it myself. All right. Thanks so much. We're going to hear a piece now from the new recording, Sorrow. This is uh, Sorrow Two, Lanto y Largo on CKCU. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you.